Um, my name is Jimmy. I'm a software engineering manager at TV2 Denmark. Um, um, and TV2, where I work, is a, is a streaming uh, company and a, a regular broadcasting company. Uh, the company was founded in 88, where it is a traditional broadcasting company, uh, and it started with just one TV channel. Today we have six TV channels, live channels, and uh, we also run a streaming service, and that's the where my team comes in. Um, me and my team are responsible for building the APIs uh, that's behind every client. We'll get into that later on in the slides. Um, so it's our API that we're going to talk about today, uh, why we chose GraphQL, uh, what problems we had that we were trying to solve with GraphQL, and what we learned along the way. So first, a bit of history. Um, back in 2004, uh, TV2 uh, decided to launch a streaming service, and that was really before the internet was ready uh, to, to, to handle the bandwidth that a streaming service needs. Um, but back then it was launched under the name TV2 Sputnik. Um, it was built on a LAMP stack, like basically any other web application at that time. Uh, and the, the website you can see also looks like any website at that time. That was the first version of, of Sputnik at that time. Um, in, two, in 2012, uh, the company decided to rebrand it, uh, not only creating a better and more useful design, but also changed the name to TV2 Play instead, which is its cur current name. But it was really just a, uh, uh, a re-shine up of the, of the old application. It was still on a LAMP stack. Um, and around 2014, um, the company started to ramp up the PR for the service, and that eventually ended up with more and more customers streaming in. And at that time, we, we were not really able to, to scale our monolith or do anything that really made a big impact of, of uh, the amount of customers were coming in. So around 2014 to fi 15, we decided to get rid of the old monolith and break it into microservices and, and basically build everything from scratch again. Um, so a bit about how we d what we what we did and some of the problems. None of us really knew anything about what a microservice is. We know, knew that it should have bounded context, but we didn't know what bounded context was. So the first few attempts really didn't uh, fly. They failed quite miserably. And eventually, after failing enough times, we got the grasp of, uh, of what it is and, and what it means uh, and all the new problems that we were faced with in, in a distributed system. Um, we chose the JVM instead of PHP. Um, we also knew that that insight into our microservices was quite important. Um, with our old monolith, we didn't really, we had some, it was running on, on Apache. So we have had, of course, some insight into the Apache uh, server, but we knew that we needed even more. So we chose Datadog as, a, as our insight. We also decided that from day one we wanted to containerize everything, so we chose Docker. Um, we also needed somewhere to somehow to deploy and to test our software, so we were use or we chose uh, Jenkins as our, our CI/CD tool. Uh, uh, when we started out, we started with with the Rancher um, as our orchestration engine for for our Docker containers. We eventually like. Within the last year, we chose uh, to, to change that to Kubernetes, and even Ranch has changed itself to Kubernetes underneath as well. So that, that works quite well for us, and we are running mainly in AWS instead of on-prem. The first version of our, our microservices looked kind of like this. So every service had its own host name. Every service had its own context, of course. Um, but it was really up to the different uh, TV2 Play clients to find out if I need to do this functionality, which service do I need to talk to in order to fulfill that request? So there was a lot of, of, of business, business logic inside every app. Um, and it's a complex setup. We have Android phones, we have Apple phones, we have Apple TV, Android TV, smart TVs, and of course all the different problematic browsers that also understands the internet in its own ways. 
So it was quite complex uh, setup. So some of the challenges that we were were facing is that it was different teams working on different client, and we were working on the back end. So we tried to do some some documentation of the APIs. We we used uh, different tools for generating documentation to give this give something to the client developers, but because the client developers really needed to find to to access one server on a host name based on what they wanted in the app was a prob was a problem for us there was different teams so they interpreted the the documentation differently everybody had their own understanding of how to read this documentation that so that eventually led, led into different clients with different behavior um and there was a, a general lack of communication between the teams, even though they were located the same, the same place and the same office. Um, so one of the things that we, we noticed, we looked into one of our, our I think it was an iPhone. It, it took incredibly long time for that device to load the front page of our streaming service. So we put in a, a proxy in between to see what, what it was doing. And what we found was that <coughs> because the client developers need to look at and know what each uh, microservice does, it also means that they were in charge of, of requesting the services and the order of things that were requested. So in this particular, um, in this particular example, um, they made one request to, to get the name and the, the metadata of the front page. They made a request for every deck of content that's in the app but they did that um, in a way that they, they made one request. When they got the response, they made the next one. So it took around like half a minute sometimes to load the front page of, of the app, when most of that work could have been done in parallel. Um, and back to, to the different needs of the different clients, we have devices with small screens that has a need that you have on a small screen. You have uh, TVs with big screens, some of them are on wire, some of them are on Wi-Fi, and some of them are, are on a mobile network. So there was different, different needs for the different clients. The one with the small screens didn't really need as much content as the ones with the big screens. And the ones with the big screens usually ha were on a more stable network than those that you have in your pocket. Maybe you're sitting in a bus and you're switching from one antenna to the next one. So some of our findings was that the standard rest endpoint that we had been working on for, for many years was not really doing uh, what, we were, what we wanted from them. Um, we wanted thinner clients. We wanted to move the business logic out of the clients and into the backends instead to ensure that the clients would be more consistent with each other. Um, and we didn't really uh, want the clients to know the different host names of, of the each microservice um, and its context. Context. So we started looking into what, what can we do instead. We knew that we wanted to put something in front of our microservices, some kind of gateway. And one thing we looked at was uh, a general purpose gateway where every client would just request this single point of entry. Uh, but because of the diversity of the different clients, the, the endpoints, the rest endpoints of that service would have to be very, very general and probably be with a lot of, of uh, query parameters or something for to, to actually serve the needs of the individual client. Another one we looked at was the BFF, backend for frontend, where we looked at creating one API per type of client. So, for example, an API for, for smart TVs or an API for mobile devices, uh, and an API for, for web clients. And that, that would take care of the business logic, it will take care of the order of requests, uh, and it would make the individual APIs more specific to, that, to the needs of that client. The problem here is that, as you can see, it's a spider web of, of dependencies in between these services, and maintaining this and just to get insight into how are your application running would be quite complex. Um, so these two, um, 
these two approaches actually solve some of our, our requirements. Uh, but a general purpose API would require uh, a boatload of query parameters to serve the needs from, from, from one specific client. And the BFF pattern would, would require us to um, either duplicate a lot of code or create uh, specific libraries that they could share because even though the different clients have different needs, they also have a lot in common. And that common code had to, uh, to live somewhere, for example, in, in a library that they could use. But that kind of goes against what you want in a microservice environment uh, because that would need that when we made changes to that library, we would have to deploy each client with, with a bump version of that library and that kind of defies the, the purpose of microservices. So we started looking into GraphQL. It was quite new at that time. Um, we just read some blog posts about it, and it seemed that it could solve some of our needs. Um, so to GraphQL. Um, what is GraphQL? It's a query language. Uh, and and it's it's a, a query language, which means that you query just like a, you query a My, MySQL database or something else. So you, as the client, know exactly what you will get from your client. So it's deterministic. You send a request, and you know exactly what kind of data you will get back. And in your request, you only get the data that you actually ask for. One of the other problems that we have is that when when we were on the REST API, it, maybe you wanted just one field in that uh, JSON response, but you would re re uh, be delivered a, a full document. And one thing is bandwidth on a mobile device somewhere out in the countryside, but also the load that you put on your server to just respond with this one field uh, with a complete document. It's a bit of a waste of, of bandwidth and CPU. So what does that mean? There were some things that we did really, really liked and some things where we needed to think quite differently because we've been used to REST APIs for the longest time. Uh, one thing is that it's schema-based, so that helps with documentation and limiting the misunderstanding of how to use the API. Um, it can run on different protocols, but mostly it's used on the HTTP protocol, which is well-known by almost everybody that works on the internet. Um, and it leverages the uh, HTTP post, uh, post uh, messages. Um, yeah, so it's a query language, which means that it's deterministic. Um, so you know what you're going to get. Um, you can send both reads and, and writes. So your reads are called queries in, in GraphQL, and changes are called mutations. So that's, this, that's the two different queries that you usually usually use. And it's a type language to some extent. So that means that you can actually, that you get some free validation that when a parameter is sent, you can set in your schema, this needs to be an integer. And, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't, uh, if it's not an integer that, that you receive it, you don't really need to implement anything to, to validate that uh, input. And then there were some things that we needed to rewire our brains around. Um, one thing was that we all learned that get requests should not have side effects, post requests have side effects. You use put for one thing, you use post for another thing. Uh, but with GraphQL, you send posts for everything. Mutations and queries is a post request. Um, so GraphQL kind of made its own equivalent of that is that queries should not have side effects, but mu mutations have side effects but both of them are sent with a post request. So you use these two uh, methods instead of all the army of, of methods for of a, a REST service, and that we needed to get used to. Uh, another thing was caching, because I don't know how much you know about caching, but usually it's it, it works like this, uh, side effect or no side effect. So if you send a get request to, to a cache, layer somewhere. It, it knows that this does not have side effects, so it's, it's cached for some certain time, and then it's returned to you. But post requests is a mutation or a change when you follow the normal HTTP protocol, which means that it's not really cached by nature. And as everything is sent as a post, that was a problem. 
So let's look into uh, how to query a, a GraphQL server. Um, yeah, so it uses post. Usually people use post. You can actually both send a post and a get. You can send a mutation with a get, for example. Um, it's JSON-based. And JSON-based, it means that every time you make a request, the body contains these three fields, and that's it. So the, one, the first one is the query. That's the actual GraphQL query that you are sending. The second one is variables, because um, um, GraphQL discourages uh, string interpolation. It means that you should not change your query from each request. The query should be static, and then um, you just use variables to change, the, for example, an input parameter or something. And then you have operation names, which is basically the, the name of the query operation that you're sending. <coughs> and there are some for the JVM, there are some different implementations. The usually there is most, uh, when it's Java, you use GraphQL Java library. Or when it's Micronaut, for example, you use the Micronaut uh, GraphQL module, and then you'll get a GraphQL controller. And this response from the server, so regardless of the transport protocol, you're always getting a, a JSON document back. And the response has one of these or both of these fields, a data and error. Data is the result set of your query. And an error is there to support partial failure, which is quite a nice thing to have when you work in a microservice environment. Because let's say we have this setup where a mobile phone is querying a, a GraphQL server, and that server has two downstream uh, dependencies. So let's say, is it moving? Good. So let's say that one request is sent, and that the server would then in parallel forward the request to, to the different uh, downstream services, but then so suddenly one of them dies, and it only gets a partial response. So that's what you can use partial errors or partial failure for. So you actually get the result set from the surviving service and an error telling you that I was not able to fulfill this part of the, your request. Yeah, so in this case, both data and error would have content. And some of the um, some of the queries that you do, uh, there are different terminologies of the different queries or qu query uh, terminologies. Um, this is from our gateway. It's a, it's a request to ask for for taxonomy of security schemes. Some of our content has DM. So here the client asks, what kind of security schemes do you uh, do you understand? And each of these inputs are called fields. So technology, uh, tech, that's a difficult word. Security scheme, nodes, uh, key value are fields. And here, when you send the request, you the reason why we have nodes is that from the schema, the client can see that what in the result set, you will get a list of, of responses back. So that's why it's nodes. So the request will look like this. And it looks exactly like, or the response looks like this. It looks, if you look at it, it has exactly the same fields in the request as in the response. So it's, that's why it's deterministic. So you know what you're going to get. And you also know beforehand that it's a list of security schemes that you will get. Arguments. Uh, usually with REST, you send arguments with, for example, query parameters. But with GraphQL, uh, it supports arguments at every level of the object. So in, in this example here, we are asking for entities. Entities in our, in our API is either a series, an episode, a movie, or a live event. So that's the umbrella term for, for these four. It's called entity. So we're asking for entity with a certain ID. We ask for the title, the description, and the art. So that's some of the images that's attached to that uh, entity. But then we have a second parameter, keyframe. So we only want images that are actually keyframes. And again, <coughs> the response has the exact same fields, and the, the art that's returned has the type of keyframe. So we get that entity with that ID and only the images attached to that entity that is of type keyframe. Then we have aliases. 
Um, in GraphQL, for example, in, in this example, we are querying for two different entities with two different IDs. Uh, and you cannot really do that because that's kind of like overloading. It's two different input parameters to the, to the two different entities. Uh, so that's why we use aliases. And one alias here is the first one is called entity1 and the second one is entity2. So that means that the client can actually say to the server, when I get the re response from this query, return the response with these names instead of the original names. So the response would look like this. You see the first one is called entity1, the second one is entity2. And these are of type series and episodes. Fragments. Um, so this is basically the same query as we did before. It's for two different entities. But instead of writing the same, uh, the same fields in both of the, the requests, or both of the entities, we can use a fragment. So a fragment uh, is has the key name fragment, and then some name you call it in this type. In this example, it's called entity fields. And then on, that's to tell that what what uh, where the fragment belongs. So in this case, it belongs to an entity. And in the fragment, we ask for title, type, and references. So reference is is the web. Uh, URL for that specific content on the website. So in that way we can we can reuse um, the queries by using fragments. And the response is basically like before. We get the title type and web reference for that uh, these two entities. Fragments can also be inline. Um, and that's because GraphQL also supports interfaces and unions. So when I say that that entity is either a series, a movie, uh, an episode, or a live event, it's because entity is an interface. And these are the four implementations of that interface. So in this example, we are again asking for two different entities. And we ask for ti title and type of both of them. And on the first one, if the result happens to be a series, I also want the episode count and season count. And for entity two, if the response happens to be an episode, I also want the episode number and the season number, but only if they are uh, actually a series and an episode. So the response would look like this, because it the first one actually happens to be a series and the second one happens to be an episode. So that means that the returned objects have these uh, extra pr uh, fields in it. <laughs> Variables, and that comes back to to uh, GraphQL uh, in uh, discourag discouraging uh, string interpolation. I've seen some some implementations where where, especially if you are new to to GraphQL, people tend to just write GraphQL as you would REST, but now you're just sending stuff in a in a post request. Um, but you should never, you, your, your query should be the same every at every request and then you use variables to change the things that actually uh, should change. For example, in this example, um, we, are, we are asking for, for uh, an entity and in this example the entity ID is a variable. And we also see that here is the, the, the typed because it's, we tell, uh, we tell the um, the server that is an integer, because it says so in the schema. Um, and then they ha we have the variable. So <coughs> before, uh, some slides ago, I had that one a request to a GraphQL server is always a query, variables, and operation name. So in this case, um, this part would be sent in the query part of the, of the request, and this part would be sent in the variables part of the request. And then the server knows that to, to e exchange these, uh, this variable with the actual uh, integer 1, 2, 3, 4. And the response will look like this. Good. Something is messed up here. There. Uh, directives. That's another kind of variable. Um, 
let's say, for example, that you have a website with a simple and an advanced view. So you could actually write the query for the advanced, like the advanced query for the advanced view on the website. And then you could use a directive to say that, for example, in this example, we introduced a new variable called include ref, and it's a Boolean. And we use that for the include directive. So this means that only, we uh, only inclu include references in the response if uh, the, ref the variable include ref is true. And as we can see here, I'm sending two variables. One is the ID and the second one is include ref false. So I shouldn't return, uh, I shouldn't receive the reference from the server. And I don't. So that's another type of, var of uh, variable that you can use to leave things out of the, of the response. There's also a skip. Um, so that's to skip the field if it's, if it's true. So one is to include it, one is to skip it. So what this gave us is that if we go back to our architecture here, uh, we have some kind of client and we have one single point of entry, our GraphQL uh, server, and it has a number of downstream services. So in this case, for example, the, the client is asking for the front page with like the front page with the path, uh, the page with the path slash, which is the front page. Um, it tells the server that I'm a, an iOS device. It asks for the title and the, the path and the structures of the front page. So that's, and, and let's for example say that the green one is the, a service that's responsible for pages and the yellow one is the one that's responsible for structures. So the server or the GraphQL server can actually send asynchronously a request to both of these services, get the response, stitch them together, and then hand back a response to the client. So it's queries for fetching data, mutations for changing data, uh, it supports interfaces and unions. Uh, it's typed, which means it has, it has uh, scalars, it has <coughs> lists and enums and objects, um, and it supports both mandatory and optional input fields. Um, let me see, did it work? No. Yeah, there. So this, this is a view of, of how our graph looks. Um, there's a project called GraphQL Voyager yeah, where you can inspect a GraphQL server. And as it in the, it's in the name GraphQL, so that means that the data is structured as a graph. Um, so if we go to the query part, can you see it? Yeah. So that's the root of the graph. So that's, that's the options. That's where we would start when we make a query. Um, and we can, for example, go to, let's do a page. Uh, I click. It's a bit difficult. Yeah, so page is this node. Whoop. So, yeah. So you can, you can kind of, <laughs> it's a bit difficult. I'm not getting seasick. Uh, you can kind of inspect the graph beforehand. So that also serves as, as documentation for the client developers. And if we go back, and we can look at entities. Yeah. So that's, that's one way of looking at, at the graph and get an overview of what is actually, so what's inherent and what's an interface, what's the implementations, what can I receive? Another way of doing it is uh, is to um, is to use uh, a tool like GraphQL Playground. Usually, it's GraphQL Playground or GraphEQL. Um, Micronaut uses GraphEQL, so it's basically a website w that comes along with your server that you can s you can test queries. But you can also inspect the schema. So we have the same thing. We have the pages, entities, 
and, and, and structures and seasons and navigation. So that's the root of the of the the data structure. So we can look at page and see, okay, the page, I can get ID, title, path, subpages, and structures. So what are structures? We can traverse that one and see that structures, okay, that comes in the form of a list of structures. So let's look at one structure. A structure has an ID, presentation, title, is it personalized, and it has some kind of entities. And we can actually just go further down as long as we want and take a look at the schema. So that's the same thing when we when we query our GraphQL. Can I? Nope. Nope. Okay, it's a bit difficult. I don't see that one on my laptop, so that's why I'm breaking my neck here. Maybe if I leave it like this and escape. No. Okay. I'll see if I can do it here. So let's try to make a query. And let's do a query for the page, uh, a page query. S and we can see that I actually get help from our schema. So let's say I want uh, the front page. Can you see it, or should I try to make it big, bigger, maybe? I can't. Mm -mm. So, and I'm, I'm a platform. I am a play web client. Mm-hmm. So from the on the page, let's ask for the title and then run the query. And we can see that I get a, a page structure back, uh, or a page object back with the title Forsy, which is front page in Denmark and in Danish. Uh, we can also ask for the different structures. And that comes in the form of nodes because there's a list and let's ask for the title of the different structures. So it's, there we can see the title of the different structures. And if we look at the website, so this is TV2 Play website. A structure is one set of, or one line of content. So this is a structure, this is a structure, this is a structure, and so on. And we can actually see that, and the top one is a structure as well. So this one is called Redaktion Anbefaler. And if we go back to our API, we can see that it's the same name. Um, let's ask for some entities on that one. And it's nodes. Let's ask for the titles. And then we get the the title back for or each of the each of the the content in the structure. So that's each of the episodes in the structure. And we can go further as long as we want, like getting descriptions. We can get let's get the type of them as well. So we can see that most of them are actually episodes. I think if we expand a bit let's give me some some more structures um, so we can use an input parameter so say give me 20 structures and then if I probably if I go further far enough down yeah we can see that some of them are actually series and then we can start using the spread operation So if the, the, the response happens to be a series, I want some specific data on that series. So if it's a seri series, I want the categories.
we can see that the episode, it didn't really change anything there. These are just the name and the type as we expected. We go down to the series somewhere. Here. We can see that series actually has the, it has the, tit the title and the type because that's the common thing we want for all the entities. And we also get um, a node of category. So that's a category that's, that's uh, in the, that the series is in. So you tell the server that if the response is of a certain type, I want something extra. And that's what you get. Um, so that's how we, we built our API and everything that you can do or, or change, we do through GraphQL, even starting a, a playback. So that's asking for a video we do with the, with the GraphQL. Some of the requests actually requires authentication and, and for that we, we, um, we expect a, a regular HTTP um, authentication header. Because it's on the HTTP protocol, we can just use whatever features that's in the protocol already. So we use the, we leverage the authentication uh, where we send a, a bearer token that we validate before you're actually given the information to, to uh, stream some kind of content. So that was a, an overall uh, walkthrough of, of GraphQL. Um, do you have any questions? So after uh, all the different microservices, we built those f before we actually had a gateway at all. And we, we used Java for that mostly. Of most of our services are Java or some kind of JVM language. Um, and they're all REST. So behind, as soon as you get behind the, the GraphQL gateway, everything is REST. REST. So that means that the, when there is a request, the GraphQL um, gateway would, would forward a GET request or whatever. It's uh, through the, the REST uh, endpoints um, and then stitch the responses together. And, and usually uh, the most implementations I've, I've seen, all of them basically, and, and including Micronaut and, and GraphQL Java, uses uh, data loaders. So that ma basically means that you have one data loader for each downstream service you have, no matter if that's a, a database or another API. And then because of the schema, the GraphQL can magically find out which data loaders to use based on your query. So the data loaders and the, the schema is actually kind of bound together. So you don't need to write any logics that when I get this query, if it looks like this, I need to call this service or this service. Uh, the implementation gets that automatically. Hmm? Anything else? Yeah? Uh, Micronaut was not uh, really there when we started. It's we've been running with GraphQL for around two years now. It's a it's a native implementation. Yeah, yeah. My talk on Wednesday is not about GraphQL, but it also happens to be a GraphQL endpoint that I'm that I'm working with, and that's implemented in in Micronaut. Yeah, so, so um, there are different levels. <coughs> As I told before, that whenever you want to start a stream, you ask for some streaming information, like, for example, what's the URL for the stream? For that, you need to be authenticated. And because all of the object is protected, we can just leverage the, the authentication header. So the first thing, or even before it hits the GraphQL server, you'll be authenticated. And if you're not, you'll be rejected before. But you could also run into a case where one microservice is protected and the rest of the microservice are not. So that means that you could create a query 
where parts of the results needs authentication. And that's up to you to handle. Usually, probably you, would, you, would all, you could handle it by either send a token as a parameter on that object, or you could use the authentication header and then simply return uh, unauthorized in the error response. And in the data response, you could return what, what you're actually uh, allowed to get. So authentication and, and security basically the same as with regular REST. Mm. Can you do something like that with or There's no, when you go into that very specific templating, of course you can, you can type it, like this needs to be an integer, but if an integer needs to be some in a specific range, you cannot really do that with GraphQL. But if I was implementing that, that functionality, I wouldn't put that functionality in my GraphQL server, because that should just be uh, basically just relaying messages around the different service. So I would probably have a downstream service that takes care of that functionality. It, it's not something that GraphQL does. Hmm? That's it? Good. We're also around out of time. So one last thing before you go. Uh, if you want pizza in the evening, there's on the other auditorium, there's a whiteboard in front of them. Do go put, your, put a, a vote for, for pizza in the evening if you're here. That's it. <laughs>